All right, welcome everyone. It's a few minutes past 12, so we're gonna get started now, although I think there's still a few people who are going to be rolling in. Um, for those who don't know me, I am Emily Carlisle Johnston, eCampus Ontario's Digital Program Lead, and I'm pleased to have Seamus Weech joining us today. He comes recommended to us from folks at the University of Waterloo, and will be speaking on the subject of accessibility in VR, which is a hot topic among those in our, in, who are interested in VR in our community. But before we get started, I just want to make a few housekeeping notes. First things first. This session will be recorded and it will be shared out to all who joined us and those who couldn't afterwards. Second, there will be a Q&A period following Seamus's presentation, at which point you can use the chat or hop on the mic to ask your questions. Um, but also feel free to use the chat throughout the presentation to share your comments, share some resources with one another. We love to see um, an active chat during these calls. So without further ado, Seamus Weech is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Virtual Reality and Mobility Lab at McGill University. His work on how humans perceive and behave in virtual environments is funded by the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. He spent two years as a postdoctoral researcher with Michael Barnett Cowan at the University of Waterloo's Department of Kinesiology, which was funded by Oculus Research. Before that, he received a PhD from Queen's University in Kingston, and we are so grateful that he will be speaking with us today. So at that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Seamus for the rest of this webinar. Okay, hi everyone. Um, thanks so much for the nice introduction, Emily. I'm going to assume that everything is okay with the audio and visuals. Uh, these are well tested. So I'll let you know, uh, or you let me know if there's any issues and we'll fix them on our end. Um, I'm very pleased to, uh, first of all, to join you guys and to share your lunch hour with you, um, but also to speak with uh, this group, which is the eCampus Ontario folks. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with the work that eCampus uh, does, and it's, uh, I think, excellent. I was in Ontario for a long time in the university system. And uh, I think that uh, we can probably learn a lot from one another in terms of um, what virtual reality can do for uh, education in particular, but also uh, some of the questions of accessibility and some of the ethical or moral issues around having a technology like virtual reality, which is extremely powerful, um, but at the same time, not that well understood in terms of the human factor side of things. So I want to structure this a little bit loosely today. Um, as Emily said, I'm welcoming questions afterwards. So just let me know if you have anything you'd like me to speak more about or to provide you with additional resources like research papers, or if you're just interested in a further chat, then let me know as well. I'm happy to uh, talk further on this subject. So uh, just to give you a sense of how we got into the research in VR, um, myself, my training has been in psychology and neuroscience. And we use tools uh, like virtual reality very often to study the way the human body works and the way the brain controls the body. Um, in a more specific sense, and without going into too many technical details, we like to use VR as a way of decoupling the way that multiple sensory pieces of information are uh, coupled with the environment around you. Namely, we can use a visual stimulus on a virtual reality headset to present something that is not being replicated in the real, in the real world or could not be replicated in the real world. For instance, uh, where I work at the moment is at the virtual reality and mobility lab in McGill where we have a lot of patients um, who have experienced a stroke and they come into the, uh, the Jewish rehab hospital here where I'm uh, currently situated and uh, start on a process of rehabilitation. And during that rehabilitation process, they're exposed to different paradigms, different tasks that can help them to reestablish a sense of uh, uh, normality in their natural daily functions. And so in general, um, we have traditional ways of reestablishing that normalcy, um, pen and paper uh, tasks and sort of mobility assessments and mobility 
um, in Hansmans. And along the way, we use virtual reality. Now, that's a relatively recent development. Um, VR has been relatively constricted to expensive uh, uh, hardware and software over the last uh, 20 years, up until around five years ago, when it became something that everyone can have in their classroom or in their home. And uh, they can also uh, have those very easily and widely available in the clinic. And so we use them for presenting people with a visual stimulus that we can control with uh, pinpoint precision to allow us to provide a well-controlled way of exposing people to environments that would otherwise be unsafe. For instance, uh, mobility impairment uh, might be well rehabilitated by showing someone an environment where they have to walk through a series of obstacles, um, we can use an environment where the individual is not likely to fall or experience any trauma and is also likely to be able to rehabilitate in a natural way. And the point here is to use VR to enhance the way that we can present natural stimuli because the way that the brain and body work is that they learn from exposure to the natural environment. And so VR has been very useful for us. Um, along the way, we've had several issues that we have to combat. And similarly to using VR in the education uh, domain, we have to think about our user. Um, this is the same for developers uh, in the gaming sphere, in the industry sphere as well. Um, the most important part of the loop in VR is the user and how they'll experience the application. And so uh, in people who have a uh, stroke, um, many of these individuals have difficulty with embracing new technologies. This sort of psychological barrier is something you have to be acutely aware of um, with these at-risk populations. Um, we try to get past that by using uh, introduction techniques that will show people that this is very safe exposure, that it has uh, many, many positive benefits and that it's not replacing the classical methods of rehabilitation or indeed um, learning in the, um, in the education uh, sphere. And so uh, the important thing is that people need to know that this is on top of whatever they would be normally experiencing. If that's not the case, then we have a, an issue. And um, the issue is that people who are not appropriate for virtual reality use, and I'll talk about some groups for whom virtual reality is more challenging in a moment, um, virtual reality might be biased against them. And that's a relatively controversial uh, uh, proposal, but it's something that people are starting to talk more and more about, um, especially in the United States where we have, like it or not, a very litigious uh, culture. Um, and it's possible, and we'll talk about why that is, that uh, VR might be under the scope in some sort of uh, uh, legal situations in the near future. So uh, just a sort of general background. Um, what I want to talk about in particular, uh, which focuses on my research, is the question of human factors in VR. Now, human factors being the way that we experience VR, how does it impact our behavior, our perception, our long-term well-being, and our short-term well-being and enjoyment of the experience. Um, like uh, many of you who have potentially used virtual reality, we all experience the issue that um, people who are not engaged uh, very quickly with a new technology may not adopt it. And the important thing for us is to increase uh, engagement with the technology if we are to expect people to use it in the long term. And so um, questions of uh, engagement are what we've looked at in our recent research. Um, in particular, across a diverse population, we need to know that um, for individuals who are either um, uh, very young, so infants between the ages of eight and 15, that virtual reality is an experience which is appropriate for them, that they can enjoy, that they will engage with relatively quickly and that will not leave uh, long-lasting side effects. Um, the question of side effects is something that we've studied a lot. So VR, as many will know, um, is uncomfortable for some people. Um, in particular, people who have uh, problems with their balance or mobility are less likely to enjoy VR because of this side effect of motion sickness. Um, motion sickness is a kind of 
tricky uh, thing to overcome. We've tried to do so in the lab with several different techniques, mainly because we encounter cyber sickness or VR sickness or motion sickness so often in our experimental setups. And so the first initiative we uh, tried to use to solve this issue involved a relatively sort of scientific approach where we're, um, we actually developed a technique to stimulate the sensory systems in order to reduce the problems experienced in virtual reality. And uh, when I say problems, what I mean is that when you sit somebody down and you expose them to a virtual reality simulation, this could be a sort of tourism simulator where you're moving someone through the Taj Mahal to expose them to an interesting and exciting experience. The mismatch that they experience between what they're seeing with the headset and what they're feeling with all of their other sensory uh, channels, their modalities, including what they are hearing, what they're feeling with their uh, touch sense, and very importantly, what they're experiencing with their sense of balance and orientation, which is the vestibular system inside of the inner ear, the set of tiny bony organs, which if you close your eyes and rotate your head, tell you whether your head is upright or not. And so what we, uh, what we tried to do was to solve this mismatch problem by electrically stimulating the vestibular sense, these organs in the inner ear. It's a relatively coarse approach. Um, and what we found was that while we were able to reduce sickness and increase comfort, it's a relatively uh, invasive technique. Um, people don't necessarily like the idea of current being applied to the skin around the head in particular. It's also a technique that cannot be used in some populations like people who have a pacemaker or pregnant women. And uh, it's not a very holistic approach. It's not a very generalizable approach either. It cannot easily be used in the field. Um, however, we also found that this technique enhanced the sense of being immersed in a virtual environment. And so these two factors, immersiveness and sickness, do seem to operate in a kind of inverse relationship where if we're increasing the sense of being immersed in a virtual environment, we're also decreasing the sense of sickness or discomfort. It's possible that that's an attentional effect, that people who are attending more to the environment around them, if they're really immersed, feeling like they're in the Taj Mahal, they might not pay the same attention to the problems of the conflicts in their sensory systems. So uh, we, uh, we took this information and we, we said, you know, we've, we've learned a lot here about how to solve the issue, but it's not very uh, generalizable, as I said. So we developed a second technique where we used a vibration um, just behind the ear on both sides to stimulate these tiny bony organs inside of the inner ear in order to reduce that conflict between what we're feeling in our vestibular system and what we're seeing. Again, we found that this resulted in a more comfortable experience and greater presence or immersiveness in that environment. But again, this is a vibration. And as we know from uh, uh, kind of basic psychology, vibrations in the air are perceived as sound. And so this was a relatively noisy and annoying experience for a lot of users. Um, so again, this reduces the generalizability of our kind of stimulation method. And um, I guess at this point, we took a step back and we thought, what are we trying to do here? What we're trying to do is to solve a problem so that people in the sphere of education, industry, and healthcare can actually apply a technique and improve the experience of the end user to make this a more applicable and useful technology in general. So um, taking a more holistic approach, the next part of our research uh, was focused on how to improve comfort and improve presence using a simple narrative manipulation. And uh, one of the important things we've learned from research is that the way in which you expose someone to virtual reality, namely the way that you familiarize them with the technology, familiarize them with the task they're about to be doing, and make them feel comfortable about that task, is going to really determine the experience that they have. Um, that seems relatively intuitive. We tested this in an experimental setting where we wanted to find out 
how a narrative or storytelling manipulation can improve the experience for not just university age students who we test a lot in the university labs, but also for young kids and for older adults. So for people from the age of eight up to um, around 65, I think in our sample, um, we collected data on around 150 participants, which is quite a lot for the kind of experimental research we were doing. Um, obviously we would like to do more, but that was our limit. We collected a, a lot of data. Um, in particular, we exposed these individuals to a virtual reality task, before which we told them stories about what kind of task they were going to be doing in virtual reality. The stories were either for one group, enriched with a lot of colorful, flavorful narrative information about who the person was that they were embodying in virtual reality, what they would be doing, uh, how they should go about doing it, and why they would be doing it. Um, so I guess uh, this was something that we wanted to enrich or bootstrap the experience with some um, emotive information that would increase their sense of immersiveness in the environment, their sense of engagement with the characters around them and the task, and then to reorient their attention away from the problematic aspects of virtual reality. So the alternative story we gave people was a relatively minimal one where it was just kind of small details about who they were, what they were doing, and um, how they should do it. But without any of the flavor or color that we injected into the enriched experience. Now, um, I think the results of this study really get to the crux of what I want to talk about today. Um, what we found was very interesting. We found that Overall, um, people with lots of experience with virtual reality tasks don't tend, to, uh, uh, don't tend to experience a lot of cyber sickness and tend to experience a lot of presence. Uh, that's not that surprising. From the past, we know that gamers or people with technology experience are much more comfortable in VR than non-gamers. Um, but what we also found was that people who, were, uh, who tended to be a lot uh, a lot less experience with virtual reality, in particular those who are older in age, um, were uh, first of all quite sick on average and relatively uh, moderate in terms of presence. But those who were older and had less experience were uh, significantly affected by the narrative intervention that we injected. So just in brief, what I mean by this is that people who have lots of uh, gaming experience don't really care too much about a narrative, how you introduce them to the experience. But people who don't have a lot of experience, who are older um, in particular, can be reduced to the same level of comfort as those who have gaming experience, just using a narrative manipulation. So what we're doing here is we're sort of leveling the playing field. We come into a VR experience with a very unequal playing field. Um, many different groups and subgroups uh, experience much worse experiences in virtual uh, reality. And um, those in particular, those groups are um, people over the age of 50 in particular, or around that, it's not a strict cutoff. Um, women also compared to men and um, some ethnic groups as well. Um, in particular, individuals with uh, Chinese or Indian ethnicity report more motion sickness um, in, in general. And uh, first of all, we've done a lot of research to try to find out where these differences come from between different groups. Um, but at the end of the day, what we have is we have a piece of technology which has a relatively low prevalence at the moment, but is growing extremely rapidly in terms of its uh, application across a wide series of domains, um, and it is biased towards certain individuals um, and biased away from certain groups. So uh, if you were to picture the circumstance, and we speak a lot with cases like uh, individuals undergoing cases like this at the moment, someone who is uh, maybe 55 years old who has been working in construction for 20 years, um, who is now being exposed to a new technique that they have to learn in terms of driving a, a new truck um, in order to do some um, new sort of digging protocol. 
um, that individual might be exposed to training on the truck um, for a few hours a day for a couple of weeks and then be tested on their training. That's the classical way of ex um, exposing someone to a new uh, environment and then seeing if they're uh, capable of doing so, uh, doing that in the field. Um, at the moment, what is happening more and more is that people are being exposed to training in the virtual environment. And why this is, is because it's a lot cheaper, it's less uh, dangerous, because you're, if you crash a digger in the virtual environment, it's much less expensive and there's no cost to um, the company or no risk of human uh, involvement in that. And uh, it can be repeated over and over again in a very well controlled setting. And you can extract parameters from that training in order to assess how well someone is doing over time. Now, this individual who is older, who doesn't have a lot of technological experience, um, might try to undergo this training uh, procedure, but might very quickly realize that it's not for them. And the reason why might be a couple of uh, um, reasons. One is motion sickness. People over the age of 50 tend to experience motion sickness at a much higher rate. Um, and they also tend to have a much less plastic or changeable central nervous system such that someone who is exposed over and over to virtual reality, if they're older, they will take a longer time to uh, sort of get their C legs, so to speak, or their VR legs, such that they're more comfortable with the uh, virtual exposure. And so this individual is, in a sense, being discriminated against by using this VR um, exposure to induce their uh, expertise on the, on the new technique. Now, you could easily say that this individual could just undergo the classical training procedure with the real digger. Um, and you know, this could be an optional addition to the training process. But the important thing to remember is that it's a much cheaper um, experience to expose someone to this in virtual reality. Ergo, someone who is um, not ex uh, able to experience the virtual environment uh, is a lot more expensive to train. And if we know anything from our uh, knowledge of the uh, capitalist industry is that people who are more expensive will be less likely to be hired, retained, and so on than people who are cheaper. And so uh, in total, what this leads to is a selection bias. Um, we've spoken about age in this case, but it could be equally the same question about gender. Um, we do know from many, many studies, um, and I've ran some of them, that uh, sex is a determinant of motion sickness. So people who are um, male tend to experience less motion sickness on average, even when controlling for things like um, hormonal fluctuations or uh, experience with technology or age or so on. So this is now an ethical question. If you uh, make VR a mandatory or extremely cheap alternative to um, some sort of training process or education process without uh, accurately taking into account the differences between these subgroups, then what you have is a discrimination case. And um, this is also the case for many other types of technology, but it's relatively uh, under-examined um, in, in many cases. I think the key thing here is that while you can change your prior exposure to virtual reality, and therefore make yourself less likely to experience a bad time. Um, it's less accessible for people who, uh, who don't have uh, the ability to change any of those factors like ethnicity or sex or age. And so this is not the choice. Uh, this is not a choice or something that can be changed by the individual in many cases. So um, it's, it's not really our domain in research to make judgments about the sort of ethical nature of what, what this technology brings to the table. Um, I'm an advocate for virtual reality. I've seen how it can really enrich somebody's life, um, not just in the uh, healthcare setting, but also in entertainment and in uh, opening one's horizons. It's uh, very often used in many cases that are uh, transformative, like pain reduction during surgery. Um, it's often very uh, successful in many cases of education where you're exposing someone to a task that they could not um, otherwise do. But at the end of the day, we need to be aware of these uh, factors. 
Um, I think what I would probably like to uh, focus on or make the take home message from this presentation is that we can do something about this. Um, if you recall the study I was talking about, which I'm happy to share more details on, uh, what we were able to do was to change the level of motion sickness of our participants back to a baseline or a kind of a lowest possible level of sickness that could be experienced by our participants just by a narrative uh, introduction. And uh, if we were to do the same uh, kind of thing in, uh, the, in the entertainment setting, then I think that that could help as well. In industry, it's a little more um, important to get this right, in particular because people who undergo a training experience might then go and actually drive a forklift truck in a very a high density area with lots of expensive equipment and people around. So if they're experiencing some of the longer term effects of virtual reality, then that is not just an ethical issue to protect that person, but it's also a very costly and um, problematic issue in case of damages done due to or partially due to exposure to a virtual reality task. We do know that these longer term effects occur. And in a kind of interesting test case, um, we know that these effects are more enduring with older adults too. Um, individuals who go on a cruise for a long time, like a, a ferry cruise, um, might come back to land and experience the syndrome called mal de débarquement, or um, uh, sickness after a, a long cruise. And uh, these individuals are more likely to be older in age because, as I was mentioning earlier, the brain becomes less plastic and less able to change, to readapt to novel environments um, as we get older. And so for these individuals, these effects can be lasting for several weeks, such that a week after you've stepped off your ferry, you look in a mirror and you can see your image waving um, up and down at the same frequency as the moving of the waves. And this is a well-studied phenomenon in uh, perception and psychology. Um, but the same kind of thing is very easily induced using virtual reality. Um, this is something that's not that well understood because some of the effects can be subtle. But uh, for especially for the younger people uh, who undergo VR, who have very plastic, uh, very adaptable brains, who haven't potentially reached their stage of maturation um, yet, who are exposed to long, long sessions of virtual reality because they're very engaged by it. Um, these individuals could theoretically develop some perceptual dissociations that relate to their exposure to virtual reality. And what I mean by that is that um, in a virtual headset, there's something very specific about the way the light enters the eye, which is different to how it does in the real world. Namely, everything is focused at uh, infinite uh, distance. Um, the, the kind of long and short of it here is that ocular motor problems or um, problems with the eyes can be induced by long-term um, exposure to virtual reality, theoretically, that are not well studied at all and are relatively um, uh, more significant for younger people who have developing brains. There are some studies that have shown no differences between people who are young uh, infants who have been exposed to VR and who have not. But it's clear that some of these theoretical effects will not emerge for a long time. Just because this is an emerging technology, we need longer periods of study in order to verify these effects. Um, I think in education in particular, this is one of the most important questions that we need to do more research on. And one of the things that I'm asked the most about is, how does this affect young children or even people who are at university age? And unfortunately, we are not able to say um, one way or the other what the effects are. Um, the key thing to uh, advocate, in my opinion, is uh, to be conservative. So individuals who are experiencing a VR application, um, this is the same, the same could be said for AR as well, um, to a lesser extent, should be cautioned on the potential issues that this could, uh, this could induce. 
And in particular, play sessions should be short. Um, these individuals should be well schooled in terms of some of the techniques that can be used to reduce the effects of sickness. Um, some of those, apart from some of the techniques I've talked about here, are to take breaks, to make sure that the distance between the eyes is properly calibrated, to make sure to um, ingest plenty of cool, refreshing water and maybe some ginger as well. There is some literature showing ginger as an effective counter therapy to sickness. Um, but also to be aware of the fact that um, at the moment at least, virtual reality doesn't seem like it's uh, applicable across the board without um, this sort of inherent bias. And so while people at the higher level of development in VR need to really be careful about that, I think it's an important thing to educate everyone on um, if we're going to try to improve our sort of uh, ethical administration of VR in whatever setting, um, be that education or healthcare or uh, entertainment. So uh, I probably want to pause it there and see if we have any questions or things that you'd like me to speak more about. Um, I should warn you, I can speak on this topic for a very, very long time. Um, so if you get me going with a specific question, then we can always finish it off by email afterwards. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it there and I'll let you either enter your questions in chat here, um, which I have access to, or um, you can feel free to fire away on the microphone. Um, I also want to say that some of the research that I talk about here is open access, which means that anyone, even without an affiliation, can access it for free, uh, can share it freely as well. Um, but for the files that are not open access, of course, uh, nobody expects that you would pay $30, $40 for those papers. Just send me a message and I'll share you a, a private copy um, of, that, of that research. I'm gonna start with a question if that's okay. Is that Emily? Yes, it is. <laughs> Hi. Um, so does um, the accessibility of a VR experience depend on the experience itself? Like, do you notice a difference between if, if you were to take the same person and put them in one experience versus another, would there be differences in how they would feel? Um, or is it really just, you know, do they seem to experience the same effects regardless? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. We use very, very uh, widely varying uh, applications in our research. And as we're a, a lab that looks at motion sickness, we use some of those extremely nauseating cases too. And the ones that we pick for that uh, purpose are ones that have um, two things. First of all, a lot of self-motion simulated in the environment namely that the person might be sitting there with the headset on and they're being translated around the environment, either on rails or they're able to use a joystick to move themselves around. That in particular is extremely uncomfortable. Um, it's also something that can be extremely difficult for people who don't have exposure to moving themselves around with a joystick or with some non-intuitive mapping between their own movement and what they're doing with their hands. So uh, in many ways, the uh, navigation technique itself is the key uh, question when evaluating the accessibility of a task. And so people who um, are experiencing a navigation task for the first time might need a good 10 minutes to just get themselves over the controls, to know how to move themselves around. And even then, for those who uh, master the controls, the visual stimulation itself is really what's mostly causing the um, problems of discomfort. Um, but it can also cause disorientation, a lack of feelings of um, uh, comfort, a lack of competency, and a difficulty with um, carrying on with that VR task in the future. So the other thing that we look for is in environments that don't have a gravitational reference. So in particular, space simulators are a great way to make people nauseous in VR. Not that you would want to do that very often, but in our case, uh, we unfortunately do. 
And so we, we often choose those kind of space experiences. Now, um, if you can try to recreate someone's natural environment, uh, that is probably the best way to protect someone from having a difficult experience. I'm not just talking about sickness here. Um, in particular, showing someone a visual depiction of what kind of environment they're going to go into before they do is a very good way to protect them. That's great. Thank you. Um, I see another question in the chat here, so I can read that out um, for you. Sure. So you had mentioned that these experiences are suitable for people from the age of 8 to 15. Do you have research for individuals younger or slightly older than this range? And would different age groups experience BR sickness differently? So I think you, you maybe touched a little bit on that, but um, I think this is a good opportunity to expand. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for the question. Um, it is something that we're looking at a lot and it's sometimes uh, difficult to study partially because it's not that easy to get a lot of these younger participants in our research. But the, the big study that I mentioned, which did look at the younger age groups, what we did was we took March break um, in 2018 and we ran a public research exhibition with um, a museum that was local to Kitchener, Waterloo. Um, we had a really good time setting up our VR booths there and we had a little table where we would welcome all of these kids to try out virtual reality for the first time in an experimental setting. So we introduced them to the task, we had them play virtual reality, and then they, they went along their way. In this case, we had people from the ages of eight and over, um, but in other research and in ours, we do find that sickness tends to be relatively high in individuals who are young, but before the age of puberty. So around the age of sort of 15 to um, 18, we have this kind of like optimal age for comfortable experiences. People who are below the age of eight are more prone to sickness and people with young kids will know well about the uh, motion sickness problems of kids of this age too, even when driving in the car. It's the same thing in virtual reality. Um, and you can predict whether someone's going to be a good match for VR based on whether they experience car sickness or flight sickness too. So there's, again, um, there's this kind of uh, peak around the ages of six or so for virtual reality sickness that is also there for individuals who are over 50. And in the middle of that, there's a relatively sort of low rate of sickness. Um, it's not a fully deterministic relationship, of course. Some young people will be completely tolerant to VR and some older people too. Um, but the, the important thing to remember here is that uh, we, we use different ways to measure sickness. Um, I noticed part of your question here is looking at how they experience sickness. I think that's important too. Um, obviously, younger people have less control over their emetic response um, that is they're more likely to vomit um, unfortunately but that also uh, that also means that we have to be particularly careful for uh, looking for individuals who cannot respond about how they're feeling very well so that covers younger kids who often don't tell you how they're feeling until it's too late and also at risk uh, patient groups such as the patient groups that we study in our uh, research in the lab here. Um, but in, in, in general, we have the same constellation of symptoms, namely nausea, oculomotor problems, like eye problems, and disorientation or feeling like you're not comfortable with your spatial representation of your environment. But thank you um, very much for the question. I think it's a great one. We just had a few, uh, like three more questions come in. So that's awesome. Uh, four more. Oh my gosh, this is, this is, this is great. I did want to say to everybody uh, that's here, I, I was aiming to wrap up at, at a quarter to one, um, just because I know that people have meetings and it's still lunch hour. But so, so don't feel obligated to stay, but also if you're interested in this and there's like four more questions, I do want to keep the conversation going. So we'll, we'll continue um, talking about this to those who have questions. So I'm going to start with Maureen's question here. 
Did your research include any subjects with physical or cognitive disabilities? In other words, when you speak to issues of accessibility in reference to VR, does it assume that users are able-bodied but may otherwise be impacted based on age, gender, ethnicity, etc.? Mm. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question, Maureen. Uh, we do study in the lab where I'm situated at the moment a lot of patients who've experienced um, a stroke, as I mentioned, but in particular, um, a wide series of symptoms associated with stroke, in particular cognitive uh, impairments, which we often measure with sort of questionnaire techniques, but we're also aware of the medical history of our participants. Um, and very, very often mobility impairments. So problems with uh, moving, in particular with one hemiparetic side of the body. Um, this is one of the reasons why we use virtual reality is because it's quite useful for these patients in inducing rehabilitation. And uh, rehabilitation is often known as a kind of repeated practice. So if you repeatedly expose somebody to a task which exercises some uh, loop between the person's um, effectors, so that maybe their, their hands or their uh, limbs, and the brain, then you strengthen that link, that loop. And so with VR, we can over and over expose someone to a task where they repeat the same action and focally exercise that loop. So uh, in many of those cases, we have to face questions of whether someone is able to consent fully to uh, virtual reality, but also to the experimental process in general. And in our research, uh, we kind of take the golden rule that what we're trying to do here is to make a positive impact on people's lives, whether that's in rehabilitation or whether it's in producing findings that can help in the long run. And um, we ourselves think that that um, is a very uh, useful outcome for these individuals. And for the most part, what we find is that people are very eager to experience a VR application um, uh, in, in general because it's quite exciting, it's very different to the normal kind of boring tasks where you'll just push down on a lever multiple times and then have someone explain to you um, why you might be doing it. And so um, in, in general, we, we, do, we do require in much of our research the individuals to be able-bodied, but VR is very uh, useful for those who are not able-bodied as well, for individuals who might be bedridden or otherwise. Um, I hope that that broadly answers your question. I think you might be tapping to something a little bit deeper, which we can talk about offline if you're interested. I'd be happy to. Thank you. Uh, are you okay if I drop your email in the chat? Absolutely, please do. Okay, or I can private message it to whichever you prefer. Um, and, okay, I'll do that then. Would you say that individuals who are okay with VR before reaching puberty would continue to be okay, um, or could that change later on? Yeah, uh, again, great question. And that's not something we've in particular studied, um, but individuals who have a relatively low prevalence of sickness in their past tend not to experience it later on as well. We have this kind of gold standard questionnaire, which we ask people during their childhood on the one hand and over the last five years, how often do you experience sickness in planes, cars, uh, roller coasters, uh, boats, and so on. And we do find a good predictive value there. Um, puberty is, it's a kind of soft uh, criterion, a soft cutoff here. But in general, we do find that your history predicts your future in this case. Again, it's not deterministic. Uh, sadly, we can't 100% predict that, but it is a sort of soft rule, definitely. Thank you. Um... A few more questions here. Do you anticipate that current research will lead to significant strides forward um, in, in the near future in the areas of cyber sickness and the long-term altered perception issues? Uh, yeah, thanks, Lynn. Um, I definitely hope so. I, I think that's the, the goal for us. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting things that we've worked on, uh, in particular, this kind of vibration of the uh, vestibular system has just been published by a company who has patented the technique. Um, I'm a researcher, I'm, I'm not a, an industry person, I'm not interested in kind of widely uh, making available these techniques, but other people are and they seem to be being used widely now um, in the military and um, 
potentially in consumer devices. So that's something that excites me because it can improve the comfort. Um, Long-term altered perception issues is something that we're just moving into really, but we're working with industry in particular, places where, as I was saying, it's very important that your long-term alterations in perception are noted and that we're aware of what they could be. Um, that's, that's kind of where we're trying to move the needle the most at the moment. So I very, I very much hope that that is uh, the case. And again, I can talk about what I think will happen in more detail um, offline if you're interested. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, I just dropped your email in the chat there. I think Lynn had another question. Um, but before that, I, is there a difference between, um, or have you seen a difference between the hardware that's used to view VR content, like a Google Cardboard versus an Oculus, for example? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, you can't really uh, compare without noticing the huge disparity between um, sets like the Oculus uh, consumer version one, which uh, tracks somebody's head in 3D space. And if they move their head, then the environment stays where it is rather than coming with the observer. Um, if the environment comes with you when you move your head, that's extremely nauseating. And with Google Cardboard, which has accelerometers that detect rotation of the head, but no translation or linear motion of the head, that's a really problematic situation. So cardboard, no. Uh, try not to use that unless you're just showing someone for five seconds what VR could look like. Um, resolution is something that differs between all of these sets too. Of course, uh, the higher the resolution, the lower the likelihood of getting ocular motor strain. Um, there's a whole litany of uh, research on field of view as well, where having a bigger field of view is not necessarily that helpful. It can be nauseating as well. Um, but there is, uh, I would say, for the most part, things like the Oculus CV1, the HTC Vive, the Oculus Quest, and so on, are very good. They're pretty much our gold standard for um, comfort and orientation, that kind of thing. Yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, and, and Henry says, thanks so much. So Tony asks, is there any difference between wearing eyeglasses versus not? Uh, yeah, thanks, Tony. I haven't seen differences in particular. And we have um, most of our, well, almost everyone who wears eyeglasses, we have them wear them in our VR tasks. Um, because if you don't, then you're risking very problematic uh, exposure to a blurry environment. Um, but ideally, people wear contacts if they can. And the reason is because you can move the glass, glasses into a suboptimal position very easily with a headset. Um, you might have some scratching of the lenses of the headset or the glasses themselves. Um, so motion sickness is not an issue with eyeglasses in particular, as far as I'm aware. However, um, calibrating the distance between the eyes is extremely important. And there's a colleague in the US who is doing great research on this, showing that um, some of the differences between men and women in terms of sickness might be related to the uh, differences on average between the interpupillary distance of men and women. So women tend to have a smaller distance between the eyes on average. And these headsets often cater to the male sort of uh, average and not the female average. So if you have the ability to do so, um, really you want to calibrate that distance with the headset itself. And if you don't, then you're risking further problems. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. And I think the, the last two questions that I'm seeing in the chat here are from Lynn's group where there's about seven of them listening. Um, so the first is, is AR an alternative um, for those who experience sickness with VR? Yeah, um, it's certainly an alternative in some cases. Um, thanks, Lynn. So the, I think the, the important thing is to remember that AR and VR, while they're often lumped in together, they are very different in terms of their application. Um, virtual reality can create someone's environment completely artificially and in a very uh, convincing way in many cases. AR is simply or not necessarily simply, but it's overlaying an environment with additional elements. It has some problems in terms of um, 
restricting something in the field of view that VR does not have. So you can't block out light, but you can add additional light with AR. Um, but we also know, and this is something that I'm actually writing on at the moment, that AR is extremely comfortable for the most part. Um, the reason for this is, again, as I was saying earlier, if you have someone in their natural environment, there's no mismatch on average. If you expose them to an AR simulation where um, there's just a few additional elements in the scene, there's nothing to cause a nauseating problem. Um, so for some cases, AR is very, very useful for that, for that reason. It's also less disorienting, but it's not necessarily at the same stage as VR. Um, some of the most popular AR systems are the HoloLens or uh, Magic Leap, which are very much not consumer devices. I think in the next 20 years, we may well see a convergence um, of VR and AR where a system can do one or the other using a pass-through camera on a VR headset. But for now, that's not the case. Um, and so while VR is uh, it's problematic, it's much, much more powerful in many ways and much more useful for, uh, for some of those um, cases. Um, but thanks a lot for your question. Yeah, and that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so another group, uh, another question from Lynn's group along the same line of a, like how to, how to make this more accessible or enjoyable for the user. Um, so I have found that if I get nauseous in certain situations, like plain turbulence, if I listen to loud music, then the nausea goes away. Um, so have you looked into sound damping, sound damping nausea? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. Yet yeah, we have looked at sound and there's a colleague at Toronto Rehab um, in particular who has looked at how pleasant sound can reduce nausea and motion sickness. Um, that's something where you might be experiencing uh, a kind of attentional reorientation. So your attention is being diverted away from the unpleasant feelings of internal discomfort and towards something else. But at the same time, um, this could be touching on the uh, method that I was speaking about earlier, which vibrates the vestibule. It's a little bit of a stretch to say whether that could be the case, but um, we, we do know that adding a kind of a very high magnitude stimulus to one of the sensory channels can reduce the bandwidth or kind of attenuate the ability to process other sensory information. And so if music is taking up all of your bandwidth in your sensory processing, then potentially that's reducing the conflicts that are occurring in your other sensory systems. But that's definitely something that um, is an active area of research. And I would also say if it helps you, then keep doing it, even if you don't understand how it works. Thanks for the question. That's great. Thank you, Seamus. So we are nearing one o'clock. So I'm going, I'm going to have to hop off to another meeting, but I just want to say thank you so much um, for, for your presentation, for answering all of these questions. I know I found this really interesting and helpful. And I, I think based on the questions um, that you got, uh, the, the group seems to appreciate it as well. So thank you. And thank you to everybody um, who, who stayed, who stuck around to ask their questions. Um, I will just drop Seamus's email right in the chat again um, in case you think of any other questions. Um, but other than that, have a great afternoon uh, and, and thank you again. Yeah, thank you so much to everyone. Um, again, feel free to get in touch, even if it's just a small message of I was curious about X or Y. I'm always happy to chat about these things. Um, so thanks also to you, Emily, for organizing and uh, I appreciate it and hope you guys have a great day. Take care. Bye.